This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. On the show, I have Frank Curzio, and Frank is with Stansberry and Associates. He is the editor of the Small Stock Specialist. It's an investment advisory uh, that features stocks below ten dollars. Um, before joining Stansberry, Frank wrote a newsletter for TheStreet.com, very similar. Uh, he's been a guest everywhere: the CNBC's Cudlow Report, the whole nine yards, and uh, you know, he's for fifteen plus years. You know, Frank has had a lot of people following his work. Uh, Frank, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Glad to be on the show, Michael. So listen, let's let's uh, I should I should give some background about for people that are not familiar with uh, and you're gonna be able to explain a lot about yourself, but a a little bit about Stansberry and and just my how I came into somewhat of the Stansberry world years ago. So I was unfamiliar with Stansberry and uh, and this be Stansberry Associates, Porter Stansberry's firm. And uh, I got an invite to come down and be a guest at an event they were holding at Jekyll Island. And to show you how naive I was at the time, I did not even understand the significance of Jekyll Island. Um, So I went down, had a chance to meet Porter, all his folks. And it really was kind of, for me, my awakening to, or one of my awakenings to a a very libertarian uh, thought process. Had a chance to meet Doug Casey there for the first time. And so just a really interesting crew of folks that I've become friends with from uh, Dave Eifrig to Steve Sugaru, Brian Hunt, um, just, you know, a bunch of good guys. I tell you the really interesting thing for people out there that are not familiar with Stansberry is the reach. And I'll just give one simple example. Many, many years after my books had come out, uh, I didn't even realize this. I think maybe Steve Sugaru mentioned them or something. Both of my books went to the top 100 on Amazon from being nowhere close to the top 100 at that point in time. So for folks out there that are not aware of, of Stansberry and some of, the, some of the reach and insights they have, definitely worth checking out. Is that, that's a fair assessment, isn't it? Uh, a real fair assessment. <laughs> I tell you, I'm the new kid on the block in terms of editors here, and I worked for Jim Cramer for four years before coming to Stansberry. And you know, he sat down and said, hey, Frank, you know, we'd like, love to have you write a couple of newsletters for us. And I didn't realize how big their reach was either. Uh, I, I mean, it's enormous to the point where most of the editors have, you know, 20, 30, up to 100,000 subscribers to their products, to their newsletters. And, and, you know, once I got to learn the system and got to say, it, it's just amazing in terms of, of contacts as well. Uh, like you said, when, when uh, you know, you go to Jekyll Island and you're able to see, you know, Doug Casey's hanging out right next to you, talking to you for half an hour. And, you know, you're able to build contacts and relationships. But um, again, I've only been here for three years and I was amazed too when I first got here how big uh, and how big this reach is at SNA and uh, it continues to grow today because we've got really good editors uh, on board and, and we've been fortunate. Let me let me let you go back a little bit into your background for people that are not familiar with you. You mentioned that you'd work with you'd work with Jim Cramer but I'd love for you to go back and you know, you're a New York guy right? Yep New York. Okay. So because I was listening to one of your podcasts the other day and you were you were giving some of your experiences I think it was of going down to Texas so it was quite humorous uh, I was I was I was chuckling at the New York guy going to Texas and and your uh, your observations of it. Half my family's from the South, so it's <laughs> it's it's completely normal to me. You know, I'm 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 used to these worlds. Uh, but the, the New York guy entering the South is always is always fun for me. But listen, how how did you? Why don't you go back and trace your steps? Because I know your father was probably a huge influence in your life in terms of how you got started in the industry. Then maybe you might even go back and trace your steps to even being a young guy, a teenager. How did you get into this world of investing? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I was actually my and my late dad has been a, a great influence. Where uh, you know he was on CNBC all the time. He uh, wrote a newsletter for twenty five years. And even as a young teenager, I used to go and he used to pay me five dollars an hour to lick the stamps and fold the envelopes. There was no internet back then, and you know I used to 
drive to the post office uh, when I was 16 years old and drop them off and, you know, send them to all the subscribers. And I just uh, really love what he did because a, a big event in, in his company was he was one of the first people, uh, one of the only people to call the 1987 market crash in writing. And he was writing a newsletter in September 87. He titled it Crash and basically told everybody to get out of the market. So a week after the crash happened, we have this little office in Queens, New York. It's almost like a basement type office. And there's 20 news vans all around, like looking to interview this guy. How did he make this uh, amazing call? I mean, I'm sure in Queens, people thought, you know, we're getting busted for selling drugs or something. But uh, it was, uh, you know, it was just a fascinating event. And that's when it really occurred to me, hey, you know what? This is something like I, I want to do. This is cool. And I got more involved, became a research analyst. My dad got really sick. Uh, I, I took over the business and ran money, and it was still relatively a small business. And I, I wanted to get back on Wall Street and see how big it, it could actually be. So, uh, you know, Jim Cramer was a fan of my dad's. I went there, and I, and then uh, I was a, a research analyst for him for four years, just when his show started. And you know, I, I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with Cramer. Everyone has a, an opinion on Cramer, uh, negative or positive, but. Barron's came out this article questioning his performance. So as a research analyst, we had to go back for two years. And when we did that, we never realized how many stocks we actually analyzed. And in two years, it turned out to be 4,500 stocks that he mentioned on his show. Now, that might be bad because it's just so many recommendations. But as a research analyst, it's one of the best places you want to work because you're forced to learn about every single industry, every single stock, you know, all the CEOs, everything that's going on. You listen to thousands of conference calls and uh, it just gives you a real better understanding for me, a small cap guy, that you can cover so many different industries. So, you know, I worked for uh, my dad uh, for about 10, 12 years. I worked for Jim Cramer for four years. All together, I've been uh, analyzing small cap stocks for about 17 years in total. And, uh, you know, now I work for Stansberry and write two, two of the small cap newsletters there. One of them that you mentioned, Small Stock Specialist, and the other one's Phase One, which is uh, our bigger product that focuses on micro cap stocks. And, you know, that has a high price tag. And, you uh, you know, both of those newsletters are, are doing pretty good uh, this year, along with the market. Well, let me let me keep you at, at early Frank stage for a while, because, I, you know, people that follow my stuff and me, clearly I'm 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 this I'm sure there's people out there that are like, well, Mike, what do you and Frank have in common? Well, Frank and I had a great dinner in Vancouver. It was a fantastic Italian restaurant, if I if I do recall, summer of 11. So we've actually had a chance to sit down and, and, and share stories and stuff. But clearly, we're both. We're both kind of coming at this from from slightly different angles on how to make money. Let me let me ask you though, as you uh, how, how do you, when you're approaching when you're approaching looking at uh, different investment ideas, whereas in my world it's it's much more systematic, it's much more primarily technical. You are looking at a range of different ways to approach the markets, and let me also add the caveat. I even though I've written four books about trend following, very systematic, very quant, I'm not so naive to think that there aren't people out there from a value perspective and a fundamental perspective that have done fantastically well. I just like to argue the other side of the equation. <laughs> and, and I'm with you as well, and that's why I've read all your stuff, and it's, I find it fascinating because it's something that I'm not accustomed to doing. So, you know, when, just like you, uh, you know. When, when, you know, you want to learn as much as you can to, to, to get it right, I guess. And for me, uh, I want to learn about the technicals of, uh, of the markets and, and analysis and, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that you write about and some of that I actually use. Now, um, depending on the situation, sometimes it's top down, sometimes it's bottom up. And it's funny because when I sat down with Porter Stansberry for the first time, he said, you know, what's your strategy for picking small cap stocks? And I said, to be honest, I don't have a strategy. He's like, yeah, it's kind of hard to sell if you don't have a strategy. I said, look, if you had the same strategy and it worked, everybody would use it. You really have to look at the markets and, and take what the markets have given you. And I know you've said that a lot as well, even on the technical side. Uh, for me, sometimes it's uh, top down where you're looking at, at the macro economy. I'm a big believer that the U.S. is doing just fine. I mean, if you listen to politicians, with, you know, with dead in the water, things are terrible. Well, for me, I see companies at, at reporting record profits. They're going to be a little bit slower this year. Uh, the U.S. is growing 2%. We have absolutely no help from China, absolutely no help from Europe. It's terrible. And I think 2013 is going to be a pretty good year. I mean, you're seeing companies with record amounts of cash on their balance sheets. So with that said, I mean, maybe cyclical companies might be a good idea. Maybe you want to rotate into steel, stuff like that, stocks that have gotten hit, banks. 
that's just one method I use. Uh, another method I, I, I will look at is, like you said, I just went to, to Texas. I drove 600 miles with my friend. His name is Cactus Schroeder. He's been drilling oil in Texas for more than 30 years. Uh, he's had personal interest in over a thousand drilling projects. And I've been really focusing on natural gas. Uh, all those natural gas companies are now oil companies. They switched to natural gas liquids. Uh, and now those, uh, you know, natural gas prices were first and, you know, they got nailed. So then they switched to natural gas liquids like propane, ethane and stuff like that. Uh, more of a, uh, you know, that are closely tied to, to the price of oil. And it was so much supply now because they all switched to NGLs that those prices got hit. Now all these natural gas companies are oil companies because they, they're fracking for oil. So we basically took a trip through the Eagle Ford and looked at a lot of these companies and saw a lot of these projects. And it's just fascinating when you're seeing five years ago in some of these areas. I mean, you used to, you could have paid $400 an acre for farmland. Today it's going for ten to $15,000 an acre. And then... Here's a guy that's been there for such a long time where, you know, he's shown me areas. He's like, Frank, check this out. And I don't know if you've ever been to Texas. Uh, it's in, it's just, I don't know. Oh, forgive me for saying this. I'll probably get a lot of emails. Uh, but I don't know why anyone would live in Texas, but that's just me. I, it was just, it, I mean, I, well, hold, on, hold on, hold on. It's, it's, I got, I got to say though, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big state and it's, it's actually very, very diverse. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you talk about areas, you know, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, I'm sure fantastic areas. We actually travel in, in those areas. But when you get out of that, you, I mean, you could drive down roads that are perfectly straight and look 50 miles in every direction. You see nothing. But the one thing you do see is these 200 foot oil rigs in the middle of nowhere from range resources, uh, from Devon Energy. And these guys are drilling in these areas. And even my contact where we drove through these areas, he's buying a ton of ranch land out there. Uh, so, and this is like in the Klein Shell regions and even extending northeast into the Eagle Fort. So they're, you know, they continue to drill for oil. So. You know, doing something like that where, I, you know, I was driving around for five days with this guy, five, you know, five feet away from him. I thought he was going to, you know, yeah, I'm from New York. He can't carry guns. He carries two of them in his car. You know, I was afraid he's going to shoot me. Being five feet away from the same person for five days could be a little crazy. I mean, uh, but, you know, he just came up with a lot of different ideas, a lot of, di you know, so it's like a field trip. This is what we think. This is what's going on. He is fracking is an environmental concern. And I'll just, you know, have like two or three reports about this and say, here's a certain companies that we actually saw on these sites that look great. I'll analyze the fundamentals. I'll also look at the technicals, uh, maybe see if these guys are trained above their 200 day moving average, if it's an insider selling in some of these stocks. Uh, and then, you know, I'll begin that process there and, and, and see if that, you know, those companies actually make my portfolio and hopefully, you know, it's a little long winded, but hopefully that answers well, your question a little let, bit. Let me add something also, you know, once again, as a guy who's coming at this from a systematic approach, when I've been to Texas, I think the most interesting things for me are, are, are some of exactly what you're talking about. I have a, uh, uh, a gentleman who's appeared in my films, has appeared in my books, a guy named Salem Abraham. He's a trend following trader. He lives in Canadian, Texas. That's one side of his life. One side of his life is running this trend-following firm, very quant-driven. The other side of his life, I mean, there's rigs on his on his, on his uh, ranch land. He's uh, selling water rights to various municipalities. Uh, you know, I had a, I've had a chance to actually sit down with Boone Pickens in his office in Dallas. I mean, you don't sit down with Boone Pickens and sit there and start talking about technical analysis to Boone Pickens because you're talking about one of the biggest wildcatting speculators there ever was. And so, you know, they're, they're definitely... I guess the way I always look at it is I'm always a little jealous, perhaps, uh, or envious in, in, a, in a positive way of folks that actually grew up in that environment where it was like, let's go dig for oil. I mean, it's the, it's the, what was the, uh, I, I keep forgetting the film, the, the, the Paul Michael Thomas or whatever it is, the, there shall be blood or there will be blood. Yeah. The, 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 yeah, the, yeah. Blood, yeah. So it, I love that aspect of it. It's just not something that I know in, in this particular lifetime I'll ever get a chance to experience. Well, it's great. That, first of all, it's really great that you sat down with Boone Pickens. But uh, I'm sure even for your audience, I mean, you could use – I'm sure you can get a lot of ideas from Boone Pickens and also apply your strategy to maybe some ideas that you maybe didn't know before talking to him, couldn't you? Well, I think you know from a port – I think from a portfolio narrowing perspective, because even if you and I might come at this from different strategy standpoints, at the end of the day, we, we both need a market to move. The market has to trend. I mean, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the 10 baggers, the 20 baggers. That's what we want. So regardless of how we determine we're going to get in or get out, we still want the big move. We, we're all alike like that, aren't we? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's funny. You're interviewing me and I, I just I love talking to you and asking you questions. Uh, from the traders that I know that I speak to, you know, I hear that 
today's market, they're having more of a tough time than they've ever had because it's so difficult to identify these trends and they switch so quickly, whether it's, you know, the government announcing QE3 or, you know, I guess it's QE Infinity, right? (laughs) It seems like they're going to announce a QE no matter what if things go wrong. But I mean, that has to be a little bit difficult, I think, from a trend point of view. But I wanted to get your advice on that because even it seems like even when I want to follow these trends, I want to get into certain trends. Like I believe natural gas as a transportation fuel is an enormous trend. And a lot of these stocks like uh, Chart Industries is doing fantastic here. Uh, You know, I guess my biggest fear is, hey, the government coming in here and just saying, uh, you know, not allowing fracking or just trying to control the industry or they want to tax it more. Uh, I guess if I had to ask you a question and to be on the other side, how, how is that uh, in terms of trend following? How do, is it more difficult this year or is it just some of the traders that I talk to that, that say well, that? I think if, if I go back and I look at where the Fed really started to engineer th- situations, I mean, you know, post the dot-com bubble, they goosed rates down to about 1% in spring of 03. And goosing rates down to 1% then created another bubble. And now we've got a situation. But, you know, during that time, there's a very uneven trend following performance because I, when the magic hand enters these big liquid markets, it does mess up natural trends. And trend followers aren't taking a fundamental perspective. So they're going to ride a move as long as it goes. Now, if the magic mm-hmm. hand comes in and starts monkeying it around, you're going to see whipsaws. And if you're going to see whipsaws and you're a trend following trader with no fundamental perspective, what's going to happen? You're going to get out. You're going to get in. You're going to get out. You're going to get in. And all those little losses add up to a drawdown. And then essentially you're putting yourself in a position of saying, okay, I, I know I'm going to get a drawdown. I know I'm going to get these small losses because I can't predict direction. I don't know what's going to happen. And then you, you, you essentially are, it's a waiting game for, it's a waiting game for the system to implode next where you make a lot of money next. I mean, that's really what, it's very much what trend following is. Yeah, and just to, you know, also on my side too, it also hurts the fundamentals too, because you think, you know, you'd get something right. Say, even when the Fed came in and, and bailed out the banks, I mean, there's so many people that I knew that, that not so many, but a few of those guys really had nailed it and said, you know, these banks are not going to survive. I mean, we're not even talking about the big banks here, a lot of other banks that, that weren't going to survive. And then when you have, you know, Brandy come in and just say, hey, you know what, we're basically going to rescue all these banks. We're going to rescue all the autos. Uh, you know, you throw fundamentals out the window there. It, it, it's just like, Hey, you know, I thought I had it, had this right. You know, everything I'm, uh, everything I learned about fundamentals and investing says all these companies should be going bankrupt. But then the government comes in, you know, just to let you know, on my side as well, it's very difficult uh, when you do have that government intervention, and we're still seeing it today. You know, that's a really good point because uh, the fall of '08, I mean, trend followers just cleaned up. I mean, October of '08 was one of the biggest months for trend followers in history. Uh, just some crazy, crazy months. Um, but you're right, and even if, even for example, I know. Porter, Porter Stansberry, definitely was one of the guys that was saying, all these banks are going to zero. You know, there was a lot of people saying it, but it was kind of a, I say a lot of people, it was a, it was a, a niche of people saying it, but there was plenty of people saying it to where, uh, you know, hey, these banks, are they're not going to make it. You know, if, if we're going to lose Lehman and we're going to lose Bear Stearns, we're clearly going to lose Goldman Sachs, except then the magic hand starts to happen and then you you get a situation where winners start being picked and then I, it's and it's it's frankly and it, it's no use crying over spilled milk we can't do anything about it but i think it is useful for the average person out there to understand that in many ways what we like to think of as capitalism and winners surviving and losers go away uh that's not the situation we're dealing with these days no. And you know what? You follow your set of rules. You know, if I follow my set of rules, any investor listening to this follows their set of rules. When those rules, ha- which are supposed to be constant, change, I mean, it's very difficult as an analyst. You know, when it's, you know, even yourself, when you're telling people, listen, this is the way the market works. This is what I've studied all my career. This is what's supposed to happen. And then they come in. It, it, it's almost like, you know, throwing a wrench in the system. And a lot of, you know, as well as I do, you probably interview a lot of guys like this, especially older guys. They, they refuse to change all the time. I think it's important with the markets where you really have to adapt to the markets of what you're giving you. And, and if I could say one investment strategy that, that's worked for me uh, over the past 18 months is being patient because in this market, there's just so many overreactions, especially during earnings season. We're in the middle of earnings, not in the middle, we just started earnings season. Uh, have some, a little cash on the sidelines because when these companies do report and they miss, they get crushed. And sometimes you really have to go into the conference calls to see why they missed. Because you'll watch CNBC and they'll just say, hey, these companies missed earnings by 20%. And that's all you get and the stock gets nailed. 
But sometimes they miss because one of their products are delayed. Uh, maybe it was inventory concerns, uh, like just like Apple with the iPhone 5. I mean, you know, they're complaining and saying, oh, we thought that number was going to be 8 million. It was only 5 million. Guys, they're going to sell probably, on my estimates over the next 18 months, about 250 million iPhone 5s. And I've researched this, and I think even based in China, we're talking about the difference between 5 and 8 million, which is meaningless right now. Uh, you look at a company like Take Two that produces video games where the last quarter was absolutely horrible, but yet, you know, they delayed one of their titles. They delayed it. They didn't say they're not going to come out with it. And you look at Take Two, you know, they produce a game called Grand Theft Auto uh, every three years. The last time it came out in 2008, it, turned, it was the highest selling entertainment product in history. It sold more in the first week than any book, any movie, the Batman movies, anything. So, you know, one, once these titles get released, that's when these earnings really get, you know, it would be tripled, quadruple where they are right now. But right now, You'll get a chance to buy some of these stocks because investors want that immediate. Re- they want to hear good news immediately. When they don't get it, they're very quick to run to the exits. So the one strategy that's been working for me is just being patient. I mean, J.C. Penny at 19 was a steal for us. We were able to buy it at 19, kind of trading, and sold it at 30. I didn't think it was worth 40 when Ron Johnson came along. But you're just seeing these overreactions on the sell side where you're saying, "Wow, these companies are so cheap." Uh, you're able to pick them up. Uh, you know, if you just have like a 12 month, maybe. Be a 24 month time horizon, you're definitely going to make money on these. Those are one of the things that are working in the market right now for me. You know, it's interesting. When I think back to when I first started getting exposed to the markets, um, and there was two books that influenced me, and I know we've both had a, inter- a chance to interview this man. One was a Jim Rogers' Investment Biker. I actually went to Singapore and sat down with him in Singapore. Um, and Seth Klarman's uh, Margin of Safety. So when I got started looking at this, I was like, well, okay, I have to figure out what Buffett's doing. I have to understand margin of safety. How is Rogers, how does Rogers, how did he develop this geopolitical understanding of all these macro plays? How did he do this? Until along came this interesting article that said that, uh, oh, there's this group called the Turtles and they were taught a trend tracking system and fundamentals aren't relevant. So what's interesting to me is when I listen to you talk about the fundamentals, like I said early on, I'm not naive to the fact that there are plenty of people out there that have been very successful doing it. But when you just describe the Apple situation, what goes on in Mike Covell's head is like, well, you know, I know I've got a group of followers out there that are saying, well, Frank, that's one way to approach it. The other way to approach it is this this uh, 10% price correction either triggered our breakouts or our moving averages, and we either got flat or took a short position. And we don't have any earthly idea what's going to happen with uh, uh, the next production cycle of iPhones. So it's interesting that there's this yin and yang of two different, entirely different perspectives trying to get to the same place. You know, it's great that you bring that up. And I, you know, even if we weren't getting taped right now, we'd probably still be having this conversation, ask each other questions just to learn more. Where, you know, I saw on CNBC the other day and a technical analyst, uh, you know, just interested to see where they are in Apple. And, you know, a lot of fundamental guys are kind of like getting a little nervous now. The stock's down 10%. And you said maybe it's a good time to, to short if it triggers some of your, uh, you know, trigger points. But, there's another analyst that said, well, the long-term trend on Apple is still great. If it comes down a little bit below 600, I think it's like 640. He's like, it's a, you know, a strong buy. Now, how do we get from what he's saying to maybe what you're saying where right now, hey, just triggered it down 10% and we're taking shorts. How is it that two technical analysts could look at it and come up with totally different opinions when everything's so, you know, systemic? It seems like, you know, once this happens, this is what you're supposed to you do. Know, I, had, I had a guy the other day ask me in on Facebook. He said, well, you know, trend following can be any time frame. It could be micro trends, minutes or hours or days. And I was like, well, you know, really, my four books, my film are really about a form of trend following that's much longer time horizon. We're talking uh, multi hundred day breakouts, perhaps uh, much, much longer. So, you know, I don't for me, I don't see anything similar uh, between, let's say, a day, a, a day trading trend perspective and trading a weekly bar. Because some of the people in my world, and I, I don't know how this makes you feel, um, literally trade weekly bars. So they're looking at one data point per week. They're literally, you're probably, you're, are you already, you might already be getting itchy saying, Oh my God, there's no way I could analyze Apple by only looking at one data point per week and making all my buy sell position sizing, uh, uh, recommendations off one data point per week. So I think it, you know, these, these trends and how people dissect them and how they want to look at them. It can be done in, in drastically different ways. That's the short answer. 
Yeah, and it's incredible. And just to show everybody, like, you know, they're probably listening and say, well, Frank, you know, your fundamentals, and, you know, I don't know if you believe what, what, what you do, Michael. And I, I tell you, when we sat down for dinner, the first thing I said to you is, you got to talk to Porter and create a system <laughs> because I loved it. And I said, this was fantastic. I know uh, our chief Federer, too, Brian Hunt, liked it as well. I said, man, I wish you could create a newsletter and do this because I was fascinated by it. So it just shows. You know, if people listen to this, that hey, you know what? Even though I'm fundamental, I I love what you do, and I'm a big believer in it. And, and uh, you know, I, I you know, again, I I've read your stuff and, and I like it, but it's just funny how it's just to- two totally different styles. That you know, hey, you know what? We both use, and we want to come to the same conclusion. That's make you know our subscribers. Hey, money. let me let you go back a little bit in time though, because I know you've had a chance to to be around some some interesting names and characters on Wall Street. I think people will enjoy some of that flavor and color. And you mentioned that you worked with Kramer for four years. And, you know, I I, I would say it's a, sl- a slight dig that I took at Mr. Kramer in my film. But uh, why don't you go ahead for people out there that have, that have got their views, either positive or negative, let's, let's put the negative stuff aside. Why don't you give for people out there uh, that have their view – what were the positives from your perspective being around Jim Cramer? Obviously, he's a very bright guy. So, what what are some of the positives that that you could pass along that people that people might appreciate uh, from not just seeing perhaps what they see on the show and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, this is coming from a guy where Kramer did actually fire me, and this is a person that went to my wedding, and today I'm still friends with him. Uh, so, hopefully, you know, there's no bias, even though I worked for him. Uh, I mean, one story w- that I could tell you, which was pretty cool, I thought, is uh, when the Wii came out, the Nintendo Wii first came out, uh, he wanted to get it for his daughter. And, of course, you know, he's really busy. He didn't get a chance to get it. I think it was her birthday. So, you know, he went to one of our analysts who sits next to me. He says, listen, you know, is there any way you can get the Wii for me? I really need it. And this kid was kind of, you know, excuse the expression, was kind of like an idiot. So, you know, I overheard the conversation. I went on um, Craigslist. And I saw, you know, 10 people had it up and it was about three times the price. I said, whoever can get to Wall Street the quickest, you know, just, you know, answer me back. And one guy said, I could be there in 20 minutes. I said, all right. So he came in 20 minutes. I think it was selling for 200. The guy wanted 500. I gave him 500 bucks. I said, all right, thanks a lot. So within like 25 minutes, I grabbed it. I went to Kramer's office and said, here you go, bud. And he was like, oh, my God, I can't believe you just got this. How'd you do it? He's like, how much did it cost? I said, listen, don't worry about it. I said, you've done a lot for my career. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. He's like, no, no, let me give you something. I said, don't worry about it. It's 500 bucks. So two minutes later, he's a big Philadelphia Eagle fan. He's got the best seats in the world, and I'm an Eagle fan. So he emails me. He's like, how many tickets you want? I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, yeah, how many tickets you want to the Eagle game? So he basically gave me four tickets. I took to my wife and, a, and another couple, and the seats were fantastic to the point where we drove up, and there's a parking lot right next to the, the Lincoln Stadium. And we didn't even park in that parking lot. They told us to make a right. It was valet parking. They put us right in front of the place, walked us upstairs. We had the cheerleaders up there. It was 50 yard line seats. Uh, you know, you get personal chef, Philly cheesesteaks, everything, you know, $150 bottle of champagne, everything for free. So it just shows you what type of guy he is, which is a pretty cool story. Uh, with that said, I mean, there are negatives too. It's very difficult because I think Kramer is one of, and I've been around a lot of people, is probably one of the most brilliant analyst i've ever been around the thing is is he takes on so much because of the show and i would love to see him step back and don't do the entertainment because you know as well as i do you know a lot of people in the media you've been on these shows uh it it really affects you sometimes i mean people take it can get a little crazy and, and make people crazy where i would love to see him just step back create another hedge fund and just manage like, you know, 15, 20 positions, getting in and out of them and trade them. I think you have an amazing performance. But when you have, you know, that whole entertainment factor and you have to cover, you know, I was a research analyst for him. And when, you you know, we're talking 4,000 stocks in two years, obviously you can't provide good research when you're talking about that many stocks. So sometimes, it, you know, it's very easy to get into trouble. Uh, so with that respect, you know, there's a story that's good, a story that's bad, but overall, you know, I have nothing bad to say about the guy. And, uh, you know, I learned a ton under him. I think you make a good point, and I'll be very quick with this story. But it, it, the kind of the 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 effort, the infotainment, education, entertainment aspect that I think sometimes people get uh, blinded to. And years back, uh, CNBC reached out to me, and uh, they said, "Hey, why don't you come on up to our offices?" And they they paid my way, and I didn't really know what I was going to, but I figured, what the heck, I'll I'll, I'll show up. And I ended up in this windowless office, sitting directly across from Susan Krakauer. And Susan and Jim invented Jim's show. And so she sat across from me. And on either side of me were two lieutenants 
her two lieutenants, it was, I was kind of triangulated uh, by these three. And I was having at the exact moment those Seinfeld, uh, you know, memories of, of you know, uh, George and Jerry going to sell their show. And I realized at that moment in time that they, they wanted me to pitch them a show. And I, it was so interesting because they really could from it from a from an, an infotainment standpoint, and they knew nothing about me at all in terms of the content that I wrote about, but they had they had heard something that this maybe this guy has some kind of personality that we can use for something. But once once it got to the point where they, they couldn't they knew there was no stories that I could not I could not give them uh, the fun and excitement from a trend following perspective. It was really interesting to watch how that was just not that was not useful. That was not that was you know it was it was not useful to uh, how do you how do you how do you take I mean I I want your advice on this how how do you take something like trend following. And make it sexy. <laughs> I mean, it's it's kind of true. Uh, let, let me tell you something. The people that we have working for us that that's the key. It's um, it's almost how you present yourself in your newsletters because we have a guy that's great that you know, Steve Shigrud, and I came down to North Florida just to work with him because I think he's the best newsletter uh, writer in the world of what we do. And it's funny because he's the shyest guy in the world. He's just a relatively nice guy. You never know he writes newsletters or anything. But he has a way of telling you to buy you know, yen against the euro and, and we'll do it by throwing in like the Big Mac indicator and just showing you, hey, you know, this Big Mac is more here than it is there. And just, you know, you don't want to use the term dumb it down it's not dumbing down it's just explaining another way using an analogy to that makes sense in writing and we try to do that with our newsletter so believe it or not if you sat down with some of our editors uh, it, it, you'd be amazed uh you know it, the, the, the most difficult topic to talk about i mean think how many ways could you say to buy gold i mean gold used to be the most boring thing in the world and now you know they just find ways to to you know buy gold royalty companies uh which is a fantastic business model they don't even you know mine for anything they just like a finance company goldman sachs like a silver wheat or royal gold and they just take stakes in these mines and uh you know they don't have to worry about the cost they just make you know once these mines start producing they just start generating a ton of cash flow and then they take that cash flow and and throw it into more you know royalty projects but just stuff like that where you know steve's able to explain things because he does have a, a lot of tough concepts and you know tax advice tax uh things that, that he recommends in terms of, you know, housing and stuff like that. And it, it's just fantastic. But yeah, they'll, they'll find a way, believe it or not. Cause sometimes, especially me, you know, when you're talking about, you know, biotech companies, when you talk about a biotech company, trying to explain it, but you know, our job is to explain it to everybody and make sure you, you know, you understand what these companies are doing. Yeah. It is, uh, you make a really good point because it is, I've, even though I, I, I look and I say, well, I've written four books about quantitative systematic trend following. I sometimes feel like, and, and, and yes, I've hit, I've hit a certain audience, but it's, I sometimes as I get older, especially too, it's like, how do you come at this from an entirely different vantage to bring more people in? And you know, when I saw you in Vancouver at that Agora event in July of 11, I ended up speaking at that Agora event this summer and, you know, standing on stage in front of a thousand people, you can, you can actually win them over to this kind of uh, thought process. But, you know, sometimes those, stages of a thousand people don't show up every day you know what i mean i mean that's that's a great advantage because when you can when you can make it personal and you can and you can get in front of them and get them to understand well yeah i might not be coming at this from from frank's perspective i'm coming at it from more of a technical perspective they can wrap their arms around it but I, it's harder to do it on print i find i mean it's, it can be done obviously as you say but it, it's it's a challenge it is a challenge. You know what I like about those conferences too is, you know, and we're having a conference coming up too in a couple of weeks, our Alliance conference, and we're going to have a ton of people there as well, probably anywhere from 500 to, to 1,000. The good news is, I think when people actually attend these conferences, they see that you're like a real person. Like sometimes I feel like when I get emails, they think I'm like this god. You know, I'm like, you know, I'm just like I have two kids, a two year old, a four year old. I have a wife that I fight with, just like probably you fight with your wife. You know, I just work really hard, just like you. But it's also a way to to really talk to the audience, and say, hey, you know what? This is what I'm doing. Uh, I'm a regular guy like you, and I'm able to do this system. And, and look at it, successful. I'm successful. And I think when you have those audiences, and you you know they they see you. I think it's a lot of e a lot easier also in, in audience wise than writing, which you which you were saying. You know, it's very difficult sometimes to come across writing and, and make people understand this. But I think you know when you have that that venue where, where you know the Agora conference, it was a thousand people. Sometimes it's your advantage. You'll see a lot of people come up to you after the conference and ask you questions. It, to me, I, I like doing that. I, I tell people I would this would be my 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 dream would come true right now. Even in the middle of talking to you, if somebody came up and said, "Okay, Covell, you got five minutes," and I'm 
I'm about uh, four blocks from Petco Park where the Padres play. Like, okay, Covell, you got five minutes. The stadium is filled. You have no notes. Go stand out, you know, second base and start talking. And you have to make sure that those people don't start walking out of the stands. You have to keep 45,000 people there. That would be fun. Yeah, that would be fun. It has to be an entertainment factor, too, there, too, to keep all those people. Yeah, because well, so. yeah, the, the risk is if they start walking out, then, you know, you might have your stage for a minute and 45,000 people start heading for the exits. So you got to keep them there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Let me go ahead and ask you about a couple other names. I know people that you've had some experience with. And I brought it up earlier. and We went off on a tangent. But you, you've talked with Jim Rogers. What's your impression of Jim? I thought he was one of the more interesting guys that I've ever had a chance to sit down and speak with. Well, when I interview Jim Rogers, I don't want to ask him about the Fed. And, I mean, because he says the same thing all the time. He hates the Fed. He loves China. You know, it's every single interview. Because a lot of times when I interview people, I'll go back and look at other interviews. And I want to get something different out of Jim. And one time, I, you know, I was asking him, you know, where are you positioned right now? What's going on right now? And, and I forgot when it was. I think it was March 2011, right when the market really fell. I mean, small caps got nailed for like 30% that summer. Uh, and, and he was like, well, I'm short technology and long the dollar, you know, you know, I'm long the dollar, I wanted to hedge myself, short technology, and I remember questioning on it, going, eh, you know, I was like, really, I mean, technology, large caps, it seems so cheap, it was trading like 10, 11 times earnings, most of the stocks, the Intels, the Cisco's, or whatever, and, you know, I questioned him on it, and, and I was like, eh, yeah, you know, whatever, and sure enough, the guy, like, you know, it was a blockbuster trade on both ends, and I had him on the po- on my podcast, uh, SNA Investor Radio Podcast, again, and I said, you know what? I disagree with you. He's like, yeah, that's probably why I don't listen to you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so, I, I just thought it was fantastic. And, and it made me think, you know, sometimes we realize you don't realize how brilliant these people are, because I think Jim Rogers has a way of downplaying it where, you know, you'll see in interviews where he's like, oh, I'm the worst trader. You know, I'm the worst short term trader. He is a fantastic trader and he knows exactly what he's doing. Believe me. And, uh, you know, that's one of the takeaways I got from Jim. And I love interviewing him. Yeah, you know, when I had a chance to sit down with him, I was uh, it was in Singapore. It was like at a courtyard of this area where he was staying at the time. It was kind of like very tropical. I think there was a waterfall in the background. And after we did the interview, his nanny brought down his little daughter, who I think was five at the time, or maybe four or five, little blonde girl. And her and this was the coolest thing for me. It's not even market related, but she kind of was like just bouncing around, little blonde bob, and she starts uh, singing "Happy Birthday" uh, to me in Mandarin. And so Jim and I got to talking about that. And it's, it's well known, obviously, that he moved there, uh, because of his two, his two daughters, uh, you know, wanting them to, uh, a lot of people think it was for investing reasons. He told me flat out, he's like, no, I just wanted my daughters to speak Mandarin. And, uh, he said it was the coolest thing. They could be driving in a cab, uh, through Singapore. And, you know, the cab driver is, is perhaps, uh, Asian, Chinese, whatnot. And, uh, the little girl just start talking Mandarin and these cab drivers will swing their neck around like in full force. Like, what is going on? Where is a four year old, five year old blonde Caucasian girl speaking Mandarin to herself in the back of my cab? And they, he was just getting a chuckle out. It. it was great. Yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, it was, I mean, it was funny because when I interviewed Jim, he was also in, in Singapore and he was actually working out. He's like, is it okay? You know, I'm going to be on my treadmill working out doing an interview. So all of a sudden he gets into this big coughing fit. And, um, you know, and, and my, my podcast, I, I tape and then, you know, we edit and it goes out the next day. So we winded up editing it. And I'm thinking, you know, I actually told him, I was like, you okay? And we stopped a little bit. And I was like, Jim, listen, you'll probably make me really famous if, you know, you actually die right now, but I don't want you to die. <laughs> he just started laughing. I was like, are you okay? He's like, hey, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm going to get off the treadmill. Let's continue an interview. But he, he's, he has a sense of humor and he's a, he's a really good guy. And definitely, I mean, I was off the charts when I, when I, I don't know if you did on your podcast where you interviewed him. I mean, we were easily the, 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 the top podcast. We had like 50 to 75,000 listeners just off of Jim Rogers. So it, he's really a great guest and people love him. Let me let me ask you a couple other names, uh, and then then I'll get you to surprise me. Put put already start thinking of some name that I've that I don't know to ask you about that you're going to have a cool story. But as I give you some names now, you can start thinking of that one in advance because it's coming. The question's coming. So, but I noticed you also you talk with uh, a, a quite interesting guy. I've always loved the way he approached things, and I know there's been some volatility in his career in the last couple of years. But I, I've always kind of, and he comes at it from a technical perspective often, a very kind of libertarian technical perspective too, would be Jeff Mackey. Yeah, I spoke with Jeff Mackey recently, and it was a pretty good interview. I mean, 
I, I like Jeff a lot. I mean, I used to watch him on Fast Money. A lot of people, you know, saw his meltdown, and you know, I don't know if he was out of the markets for a little while, and now he's on Yahoo Finance. I'm a big fan of Jeff because when I have him on my podcast, it's almost like if I had you, Michael, on my podcast, we can go a lot of different areas. Where sometimes if you if I interview you guys, I'll interview like an oil specialist, a technology specialist, and sometimes it gets a little boring. With Jeff, I mean, you can go anywhere. It's <laughs> right, almost right. like our, the podcast today where you know we didn't have any notes doing this. We're just like, hey, let's just talk and, and go with it. And there's other people where they're like, could you send me, you know, a list of bullets? And then when you send them a list of bullets, like they just start talking about all the bullets off the first question. And you're like, this is why I hate sending the questions to these people. So, uh, you know, with Jeff, I thought the, the interview is fantastic. I like them a lot. We can go a lot of different arees and 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 he's doing well now. I think he's doing good for Yahoo Finance. It gets a lot of hits over there. And I'm I'm happy for him. I'm, I'm a big fan of, from from the Fast Money days. Well, so let me bring up the the name that's near and dear to your heart too. And I've only had a chance to meet him once and we actually I think when we spoke we were we were both kind of uh, this would be Porter Stansbury, and I was down at his event at Jekyll Island, and I, I spoke before, I guess it was a small group of Stansbury folks at the time, maybe 50 people or 30 people, um, but we had a little a little give and take at the time, and I can't remember, exa- Brian Hunt and I were trying to figure out what year it was, I can't remember, it was three or four years ago, but we were kind of having a little bit of a, a debate on, on, on Mr. Buffett and everything, but I think the thing that I like, uh, that I like about Porter is it, at least he's saying, like, look, there is an alternative way uh, to look at what you're being fed. Because let's face it, the vast majority, and once again, you and I can have our differences perhaps on strategy, but we're very similar in the sense that we're coming at it from an alternative perspective. And 99% of the population is doing one thing, which is I'm long mutual funds and I'm trusting the government's going to take care of me. And so I appreciate the fact that even though perhaps Porter and I come at it from different perspectives, at least... We're coming at it from the perspective of long only mutual funds, trusting the system to take care of me is a really, excuse my French, crappy way to go through life. Yeah, I tell you, you know, working for Porter, I had an interview with Porter when I was at street.com. It actually wasn't an interview. I just met him through a mutual relationship and went out to lunch. And I loved him off the start because I'm from New York. Uh, and, and New Yorkers usually tell you exactly how they feel. You know, you, you which is, uh, to me, I think is a good thing. A lot of people, especially in the South, they don't like that. They'd rather, you know, say, hey, everything's fine. This is a cool guy. And then tell their friends, hey, I really don't like Frank. But in New York, they, they'll just be like, Frank, I don't like you, which I, I kind of like people <laughs> up front like that. And, and you know, sometimes... Uh, I think Porter could, uh, you know, rub people the wrong way because there might be an arrogance about something. But uh, he'll never, he, when he has, uh, you know, something that he's writing about, whether he believes oil prices are absolutely going to come down, uh, we're seeing massive production of oil. Before that, you know, he prov- he knew more about what was going on with the government and, and the end of America video he provided uh, with statistics, what's going on. I mean, once he gets behind these things, I mean, the facts that he's able to generate, and he'll read like, you know, four or five books like in a week. Uh, it's incredible, like the enthusiasm he has. And it's almost impossible to change his mind sometimes. So he really knows so much about the, these subjects. But you know, working for Porter, I have to say, probably, and, and yeah, he's not going to listen to this. So I, I'd say probably <laughs> the best boss I ever had in terms of being fair, where, you know, he doesn't compliment you all the time. When you do good, it's good. When you do bad, he'll give it to you. Uh, but it's always about the subscribers. It, it's, you know, don't blow up the subscribers. Make sure, you know, you treat the subscribers good. And, and, you know, if you do that, Porter has a strategy where you work hard and you play hard. He treats us really good. We go to, you know, five star hotels where we have these conferences, but we always, all, you know, put in a lot, a lot of work. Uh, and we do it because we love what we do. So he's a fair guy. A lot of people may say, uh, you know, wow, poor that guy's crazy. I can't believe he said that sometimes. But, you know, uh, we have basically the largest subscriber base in the world uh, for financial newsletters. So that's got to say something to, to, you know, he's definitely doing the right thing because usually when people subscribe, they stay subscribers because, you know, we try to get it right and, and do the homework and, you know, like, Hey, for example, me, and I'm all over Texas uh, for five straight days trying to get the story and get it right and everything. And, and I think subscribers appreciate that, that boots on the ground saying, hey, I'm paying you this. And you know what? You're earning your money. You're doing a good job. You're really out there. You're not just writing something that someone else is writing. And yeah, that, that's a, a, a credit to Porter where he actually pushes us out there and says, listen, guys, you have unlimited expenses. Go out there and get the story right. Well, yeah, I got to tell you, when I mentioned it earlier, but I guess my, my, my quote, libertarian journey starts where a lot of people starts and you, you end up reading some of Ayn Rand's books and whatnot. But uh, from from the from perspective of looking at the Fed, 
I, I would have to say that it was that particular meeting at the Je- at Jekyll Island where I started to, because you know, from a trend following perspective, it's not relevant. Okay, it's really not relevant to what the Fed is doing because ultimately it's all manifested in the price. You just have to trade the price, and you can't control the Fed. Obviously, from a fundamental perspective, a lot of people can make analysis and, and, and make judgments. From a trend following perspective, it's not relevant. However, I always tell people, it's like, look, I might have my trend following perspective, but that doesn't mean from the standpoint of how the world should work, the right way to do things, what happens with the Fed is n- is not good. It's it's often not fair. It's not, uh, and it, it, it's usually designed to benefit particular groups even though it's presented as benefiting the whole public. And that's just nonsense. And so I, I give uh, I give Porter and the crew down there a lot of credit for at least getting me, and this isn't necessarily, like I said, not from a trading perspective, to have that awakening to where it's like, hey, this is just a really, this system really needs to be improved. Now, it probably never will be. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, we, maybe one day there's an implosion and something forces a change, but... Uh, you know, we'll get a little Ron Paul esque, but uh, so I really appreciate that aspect of it. It was at least having my the start of my Fed education. Yeah, no, I definitely agree, and, and even the listeners too. It's almost like you know, I have my own podcast, you have your own podcast, and I try to stress on on my podcast. Um, you, you're allowed to disagree with me. I mean, this is how I feel. I'm going to throw my opinion out there. And if you do disagree with me, you know, I rather people don't say, you know, unless you feel like it makes you feel better. Frank, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. Tell me why. And it's amazing when you have an audience of this many people sending you their research and say, Frank, listen, I work in this industry. This is why I don't like this. Or here, maybe you want to talk to this guy. Maybe you want to interview this guy. And it's, it's not even, uh, you know, I have a lot of hedge fund guys that listen to my podcast, a lot of investors, but also, you know, it's just as important as a lot of the young kids that are going to college telling me the hot trends, uh, you know, what's taking place there. And, and you know, you build that network and, it, and it's just incredible, which is a testament to these podcasts. And how big the reach is. I mean, it's even global, as you know, as well. And, and you know, yeah. you know, I really uh, do love these podcasts. Well, it's funny. I mean, you guys have got a heck of a lot bigger reach than I have. And I started, I started mine here in the uh, the new year, and I'm just seeing, I just see this crazy growth. I mean, it's all got to be word of mouth because I'm not spending any ad dollars on this. You know, and it's uh, you know like 137 countries or 138 countries, and it seems to be every month the listeners are just doubling. And it's and I'm sure you guys see crazy growth, but uh, it really is amazing that there's this in there seems to be this insatiable appetite for something that is that sounds or is real versus you know a guy reading off a teleprompter or a script. And I, I know I'm I'm not sitting there, so I can't see you. But I know damn well you don't have a script in front of you. You know damn well I don't have a script in front of me. And that's not the way it works for most people uh, when they're doing any kind of uh, advice giving or talking to people. Most of them are just reading a damn teleprompter. Yeah, you know what's good about this? I mean, and you see it on CNBC all the time. You might get a guy that you love on there. I mean, I like Squawk Box because you get guys on there that are on for half an hour, 45 minutes. But in the middle of the day, you might get uh, – sometimes they'll interview Jim Rogers. Sometimes they'll interview whatever, some guy that you really like, some kind of analyst. And they'll ask him, you know, tell me – explain the difference between inflation and deflation. And they give him 30 seconds. You know, why is the market deflationary opposed to inflation? 30 seconds to answer that question. Then they cut him off. Then, you know, you know the anchors at CNBC. And I like CNBC. I know a lot of a lot of the anchors there. But sometimes they like talking more than, you know, letting their guests talk. And you're sitting there going, man, I really want to hear this guy talk. Where your podcast, you're interviewing somebody for a long time. You're getting all their thoughts. And it's just fantastic. Especially when you got a guy like Jim Rogers on. You know, you have him on for 40 minutes sometimes, you know. And you're like, wow, where can you hear Jim Rogers for 40 minutes for free? You know, so, you know, people, uh, I think these podcasts are going to get bigger and bigger. And, and, you know, I know you in, in person. We met it. And I think, you know, even your personality, your radio, you, it's going to get bigger and bigger, man. You're going to be huge pretty soon. I have a question for you. Have you done? Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, as, I, as I try to move you along. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I hear you, man. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, uh, have you interviewed Mark Faber? No, I haven't interviewed Mark Faber yet. No. Uh, yeah, he uh, he is he's. I have to get him on too. He's he's great. Um, yeah, he's just. Uh, I think he actually might be a little bit bullish now. I know he just did an interview and he's worried and everything. It's just um, I, I kind of like having like the end of the world guys on because uh, oh, he's, yeah. he's he's not into the world anymore now. Uh, uh, would you say he's not into the world anymore now? Uh, you, you know, I, I, to be honest, I I like having those guys on a little bit just because, you know, you if you hear their opinion in, in before two thousand and nine, you know, they take credit for for the market crash. Then after two thousand and nine. 
you know, if you listen to those videos, like the Peter Schiff's and everything, you know, how, you know, market's going to destroy, it's going to crash. And, you know, sometimes it, it's kind of like, hey, you know what? I get it. I understand it. But there's certain periods where you can make a lot of money in this market. And it's just to have the negative opinion or even a bullish opinion all the time. I just, I like getting those guys on because uh, I like debating against them a little bit. I, I, the first time I had a chance, I had no idea who he was. And this just called me naive. I was in this trend following world. And uh, so I, I get an invite to go speak for uh, CLASA, CLSA Bank in Hong Kong, and I show up, and I'm just going to do my trend-following thing, whatever. Uh, and uh, the speaker right after me was Mark, and we were walking off the stage and had a chance to meet him. And it was a big room. I think it was at the Hyatt, and uh, three, 400 people. And I, I mean, I am kind of unknown, and I had a decent crowd in there. Man, the moment I left that stage, that room was standing room only, and he just came in there, put his elbow on the lectern, and just read economic facts and figures for like an hour and a half, and the audience was just guys sitting there just scribbling intently everything he said. It was the most interesting experience to be like, wow, this is... This is some serious cult stuff right here. This is this is this is new to me. Wow. I had no idea the following. Well, it gives you hope because if people are actually interested in economic statistics and they're writing them down, you're going to have no problem <laughs> teaching them about trend following. Yeah. Well, listen, let me I know we're running out of time here. Um let me go ahead and give you a chance to tell me something, you know, we've talked about a lot of stuff, but give me something entirely insane. Wall Street driven. You don't really want to admit this on the air. Something you saw that you just have been holding back. Maybe not for this particular show, but just in general. Give me, give me some kind of a interesting juice. Not, I don't want to use the word dirt because that sounds not good, but, but something, something that people can kind of go, Oh, wow. That was behind the scenes of something. Or you can just say, Koval, would you just be quiet? I have to go now. Yeah, I have to go now. See you later. No, come on. You know I'm going to answer that question. But I would say something, you know, something recent. I, I, I'm a believer after what I saw in, in Texas. I believe 75% of natural gas companies, small cap natural gas companies are going to be out of business. Uh, people do not realize how much natural gas we actually have. It's listed as a 100-year supply. It's more like a 300-year supply. Uh, JP Morgan just came out with a report this week saying that natural gas prices will go to $5. Uh, nobody's drilling for natural gas, but natural gas production is going higher because it's a byproduct of oil, and we're drilling for oil like crazy. Uh, now, I asked my contact, uh, how long is big natural gas rig? I was like, how long before the majors could actually save prices go up to 5 bucks? Six bucks. How quick could they get natural production back online? And he told me a week. That's how quick. So as soon as they go to five bucks, it would be amazing. It would immediate. They'd immediately jump production, and you'd probably see prices crash. So if you're looking for a trend or trading, if natural gas prices get to you know four fifty five. I'd be selling a crap out of them because the, the, what I learned about the technology there, we're only, even with all our technology, fracking, hydraulic fracturing, uh, hydraulic uh, and horizontal drilling, our recovery rates for natural gas when we drill a well is only 5%. That means we're only getting 5% of natural gas out of a well. That rate is going to go up to 10, 15% uh, in the future, maybe five, 10 years from now. We're just going to have, man, so much natural gas. I worry about anyone who's in a natural gas industry. I think it's going to become a transportation fuel. It's already transportation fuel in trucks. Yeah, companies like clean energy fuels that are building fuel, that are building fueling stations all over the, all over the United States on all the routes. I think in five years, only five years, we're going to see cars running on natural gas. All these manufacturers already produce these cars. They've just produced them in other countries. They don't do them here because there's no infrastructure. The infrastructure is being built right now, and the conferences that I've attended over the past six months tells me you're going to see cars running on natural gas probably within the next five to ten years. So I don't know if that's so much out of the box, but some of the recent research I've been doing. Yeah, I was thinking more about like dancing girls and stuff, but I guess we're not going to get that today. So you're a married guy. I'm still a single guy. So, you know, these things happen. I, I have to drive to Las Vegas today. Um, so yeah, my wife anyway. doesn't listen to this podcast, so we, we can talk about that next podcast. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, listen, uh, I, I will hold you I, as you as you just lay that scenario out of natural gas and all my trend following guys that are price only guys that are probably beating me over the head right now. I say, listen, you heard what Frank had to say. Now you can just you can take your trend following model and you can you can compare them up and you can see how it all unfolds. 
That's the easiest way. Say, hey, Frank, listen, where is the best way for people to follow you, listen to you, get more information about you? Where should they go? Well, I tell you what, we created a, a website, and I'm glad you asked because I'm terrible promoting myself. I just feel uncomfortable. So, you know, my guy sent me a, a link instead of talking about all this. You can listen to a video. It's uh, www.stansberryradio.com slash Covell. So it's stansberryradio.com slash Covell, where we have a video of all these trends I'm talking about, natural gas. That's the best way. Uh, that'll give you an opportunity if you want to subscribe to my newsletter. If not, you'll be able to watch a video, see all these facts, and say, Frank, I think you're full of crap, and not subscribe. But at least you'll get more information on it, and feel free to uh, contact me at fcurzio at stansberryresearch.com. Those are the best ways, and I appreciate you giving me the time for that, too. No problem, no problem. I, I, I noticed that, see that Covell added on the end? A tracking, a tracking cookie. We will now know, does anybody come from the Covell podcast? <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm learning. Yeah, that, that's the marketing, guys. That's not me. So yeah, I hear you though. The old, everything with the slash after the slash, after the slash is tracking, 100%. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was no doubt about that one because I know there wasn't a Covell link until today. So <laughs> it, was, it was a Covell link uh, four hours ago. It got sent to me, exactly, so to be honest exactly. with you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Listen. Hey, Frank, it was good talking. Hopefully we'll talk again soon. Sounds good, bud. Thanks. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.